Okay, here we go. So welcome. Like I mentioned, my name is Mario Sanchez and I'm part of the Sumo Learn team here at Sumo Logic. And uh, today I'm going to show you uh, how to become a Sumo Power user. So essentially this is level two. Um, most of you, I suppose, attended level one certification and you kind of got the basics of what to do with Sumo. Uh, today I'm going to show you a little bit deeper dive of what you can do. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that unified logs and metric solution, so monitoring and troubleshooting. I won't go through the, uh, through the demo again because this is something you saw um, yesterday. Uh, but I'm going to start talking about uh, a little bit of a review of the basic tool sets. I'm going to show you more options on those tool sets. But then more specifically, I'm going to dive into advanced analytics. What are the other things that you can do with Sumo? Um, and then the third one is how can you start monitoring and trending critical events within Sumo itself? How can you use dashboards? <clears throat> Excuse me. How can you use alerts? Um, and then some of the use cases that we can, uh, we can do with Sumo. So with that said, um, just like that level one certification, we also offer the training environment. This is available to all of you. Um, there's a username and password that you can, uh, you can use to get into uh, Sumo. And then there's the hands-on labs that you can try on. Um, I would highly recommend, as a matter of fact, let me go to that page right now. If you look at these, each one of these certifications, um, the one that we're looking at right now is the middle one, that red one uh, for level two. Uh, how do you prepare for this exam is one by attending this webinar that you're about to attend but the second one is trying on this hands up labs as a matter of fact let me click on that and some of the labs that we will be following today um, will be taken out ex from this same uh, labs itself so I'm gonna I'm gonna walk you through some of the examples in here so there you go here is how to get into it hey, here's the username and password um, that you can use for this and we'll be using some of these labs for uh, for the training today um, but like I said I would highly encourage that you try some of those labs whether you want to train them in the, whether you want to try them in our training environment or in your own environment uh, I'll leave that up to you but uh, the labs are very very helpful especially because they have templates that you can use in your own environment so from a 30,000 foot view yesterday I walked you through this monitoring and troubleshooting demo I won't go through it again but the idea behind it is that you can set up dashboards, you can set up alerts in Sumo to keep an eye on your critical events, to keep an eye on your trends. And whether you receive an, uh, an alert or a pager duty message or data dog or perhaps a Slack or some kind of message um, telling you that something is going on in your environment or that you look at a lot of red in your dashboards, um, you can use your metrics to start identifying what is going on. And then of course you can dive into your logs to identify why something is happening. So um, that's kind of the flow of how you use Sumo for monitoring and troubleshooting. From a high level, uh, the data flow is broken into three areas. You get data into Sumo through data collection. Um, then you start searching and analyzing that data. And eventually once you, once you have searches and queries that make sense, you can add those to dashboards. You can create alerts and start visualizing and monitoring your data. We're not going to cover number one here today. This is something that we do tomorrow. For those of you who are administrators, we're gonna talk about data collection. Um, but having said that, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about it. Um, from this graphic, you can see that we can bring just about anything into Sumo. Uh, the, the top part of the graphic shows you cloud to cloud data collection. So we can bring data from S3 buckets. We can do HTTP posts over onto Sumo. Uh, we have some APIs to SaaS and PaaS platforms like Office 365 or Google Apps. Um, we even have some customers that have some clients that are doing some straight up HTTP posts over to Sumo Logic here. Um, the bottom half of this of this uh, graphic is showing you not necessarily cloud to cloud integrations, but actually um, local local collection into Sumo Logic. So we do this through what we call an installed collector. And what that means is you put, you place a small agent, a collector in your machines, and then you can grab the logs from those machines and onto Sumo Logic. Or if you already have a centralized data collection, uh, log collection infrastructure, we can take advantage of that as well. We can grab your logs through SSH or WMI, or if you're, you, you have some network devices, we can grab them through syslog, onto the collector and then pass that on to uh, Sumo Logic. And we can grab structured or unstructured data. Um, we can just grab, grab just about anything in there. Um, again, we're gonna cover this in a lot more detail for those of you who attend tomorrow's webinar um, on setting up Sumo Logic. 
But the one thing to keep in mind is that every single log message that comes into Sumo gets tagged with the five following metadata tags. So it gets tagged with the name of the collector that the data came from, for example, prod US collector. It gets tagged with the source, so Apache access versus Apache error, for example. It gets a tag with the source host, where it's coming from. It gets tagged with the, uh, the path and the uh, name of the log file where the data came from. And then the last one, which is the most important one, is source category. And source category can be freely configured and therefore gives you a lot of flexibility. So this is what we use most of the times. So we, can, we can set this up to be whatever we want. Um, and we have some best practices and naming conventions, which um, most of you will learn tomorrow for those of you who are attending. Um, you'll see me use some of these today. Okay, so uh, a quick review about searching and parsing since this uh, most of you probably attended this already. Um, there's a question for Bertrand and the question is, is the collector doing the tagging? Um, the answer is yes. We, we actually, when you set up a collector, you actually specify what kind of tagging you want to put in there. Um, and if you don't specify any, for example, if you don't give us a host name, we're just going to take the IP address of the host and tag the collector with that IP address. Um, if you don't give us a, a new collector name, we'll just grab the, the name that you gave that collector and we'll do the tagging. So there's some automatic stuff going on, but you can overwrite those values um, in, your, in, the, in the building of your collectors as you're putting it together. All right, so um, let's do a little bit of uh, overview. So most of you hopefully know now how to search and parse, so I shouldn't be able to uh, have to teach new stuff in here, but essentially 99% of the time you want to use your metadata. Remember those five tags I was just talking about? You want to start using that metadata so that you can help uh, Sumo narrow down what is it that you're trying to find. So let me do this by an example instead of just talking about it. If I go and open a new search, I would normally start my search with some of this metadata tags that are in here. There's a few more than those five, for example, index and view. And I'll talk a little more, more about these, but these are indexes that you can create so that you can save some query results. You can also create what we call schedule views that allow you to think of it as a, as a materialized database view. You can pre-aggregate results and store them in a view um, so, that it's, uh, so that you can search through them a lot quicker. But anyway, you can search by collector. So I can say, send me all my data from my AWS services collector. Um, or you can search by, um, by source host, source name, as I was mentioning before. But more often than not, what best practice is, we suggest that you use source category. Um, because this is something that you can uh, set up and specify yourself. So for example, if you notice, most of our source categories in my training instance start with the word labs. Um, let's say that I wanted to grab stuff from AWS so I can grab the CloudTrail data. So labs, AWS, CloudTrail. But what if I wanted to search across all my AWS data? Then I can use wildcards like this. And in this case, I'm looking for all messages from uh, labs, AWS, uh, whether it is SES, or in this case, S3 or ELB, it's just giving me all that data. So coming up with a good naming convention for your source category is key because it allows you to, uh, to, to do this kind of stuff in here. So let's say that I did grab uh, CloudTrail data. I can search for that. Um, let's say that I want to search for CloudTrail data uh, that has uh, create network ACL entry. So I can uh, I can add this value in here, right? So now I'm only searching for those things that have the word lab, that are for source category labs AWS and have that particular keyword there as well, right? So um, what I'm trying to get to is whenever you can use metadata and keywords, um, that's gonna help you narrow down what you're looking for. Lifetail. Lifetail gives you the ability to run a, a, a tail session on your logs. So let me just run this. For example, this Lifetail here, you notice that for Lifetail, you want to use metadata again. So metadata is pretty key. Let's say that we want to use uh, metadata for Labs Apache Access, right? So here is a great thing. Let's say that I am an engineer and I don't have access to the production environment. Um, but now through Sumo, I actually am getting, uh, I can tail the logs that are in those servers, in those web servers. Not only am I tailing the logs from those servers, I'm tailing it from all 
servers that have Apache access data. If I wanted to focus on just one, I could do something like and source host equals whatever, uh, whatever it happens to be, right? I can specify a particular source host. Hmm. Um, I can specify a particular source host there. Um, I can also do keywords here. I can say and Mozilla. So I can search just for those messages that have the word Mozilla. So again, Livetail is just a great way to, uh, to get to your data in there. Um, okay, going back, to our, going back to our query here, let's just focus on that Apache access data that I was playing with before. So um, I can grab data that is uh, Lab Apache access and the word Mozilla. Um, and one of the things that I was mentioning yesterday is you want to start parsing your data. So as you get results, you want to start parsing your data because parsing is what gives you uh, structure to your data. So as I mentioned, you can parse it using parse anchor, which I showed you yesterday. Here, let me, let me quickly show you what a parse anchor looks like. I can grab a message as an example and say, I want to parse the selected text. So what I'm literally doing is saying, listen, Sumo, go find the following pattern. Go find something that looks like this. And anything between the word get and the word HTTPS, H a PD, uh, yeah, and the word HTTP, I want to extract that. And that variable, I want to call it the URL. And then go grab anything past that in between spaces, and I want to call that the status code. And you get the point, right? This is essentially I'm using this message as an example um, to just say grab everything in those particular things and call that the size, call that the refer, and the user agent. So I'm saying, Sumo, go find this pattern, and when you do, extract those things in those positions and give them these names. And if I submit that, it creates that little parsing statement for me. And if I run that now, hopefully this is review for most of you guys, but if I run that now, I still see the message on the right-hand side, and now I can see my parsed fields. There's user, there's URL, there's status code, there's size, there's refer. So the good news is that now these are fields that I can do things like count by status code, because status code is a field. Oops, uh, status code. Status code is a field that I can now uh, count on, right? Okay, hopefully again, this is review for most of you. Uh, parsing is just such a very key part of getting your data to, uh, to, to, do, to, to a state where you can start uh, managing that data. Um, just for, um, for, to round up this stuff, I'm gonna show you under the Home tab in the Learn tab, here in Home under Learn, um, there's documentation. I'm just going to pull up the documentation of all the other parsing statements, uh, all the parsing operators. But um, essentially, here, let me just uh, go in here. If you're sending us JSON formatted data, guess what? We have an operator for JSON formatted data. If you're sending us key value pair, or something like name equals Mario, uh, company equals Sumo Logic, then we have a key value operator for that. See and a CSV operator. If you're sending us things like tab or colon delimited, we have a split operator, we have an XML operator. And of course, we can also use regex to, uh, to parse out things. So what I showed you in the example was a predictable pattern because we know Apache has a predictable pattern. I could get away with the parsing that I just showed you. But if you have variable patterns, then you can use regex for any of that parsing. Um, so that, that should be pretty straightforward. What I want to talk about is a couple of these options that are in here. And as a matter of fact, let me show you those options uh, using some of the labs that I have in here. Actually, before I do, before I go into the options, um, yesterday we also talked about uh, that it's great to have these parse statements, but what you want to do, what you really, really want to do at the end of the day is you want to create what we call field extraction rules. And let me show you that. If I go under administration, I'm sorry, under manage, and I go to settings, there's these things called the field extraction rules. And I'm just going to open one. Uh, by the way, this here is a training instance, so I have a lot of garbage in here, but um, that's why you see so many Apache access with a, with a name in there. Um, let me just edit this to show you what this field looks like. So here, Katie in our last training class created a field extraction rule that says, listen, whenever you get a message that where source category equals something Apache access, 
this is a great example of someone who's saying, listen, if it's my prod Apache Access, or if it's my dev Apache Access, or my labs Apache Access in my case, it doesn't matter. I want all those messages to be parsed with the following field, with the following um, parse expression. And in this case, I'm using parse regex, right? Most of you probably know how to read this. Let me make my screen a little bit bigger. There we go. Most of you probably know how to read this. This is saying find a digit between uh, find a digit from one to three characters, a space, a digit from one to three characters, a, a period, I should say. One to three, period, one to three. That sounds like an IP address, right? So it's, what it's saying is find this pattern, and if you do, store it in a field called source IP. So very, very important. Build your field extraction rules, because if you do, then those fields are going to be available not only to you, but they're going to be available to anybody else in your organization. So for example, I do not need my parsing statement anymore because someone already did the hard work of creating a field extraction rule. Therefore, status code already exists, and it's a field that I can use in here. So if there's anything that you take from today's session is go build those field extraction rules. They're going to make a big difference going forward um, uh, in terms of creating that content. All right. So uh, let me show you some of the options from a parsing perspective. I'm going to skip some of these labs and go to some of the parsing options. So I talked about JSON auto, the ability to um, actually they didn't. Let me just show you. If you have a JSON formatted uh, operator, I'm um, sorry, a uh, message. Let me just open a new log search. Um, let's do this first. I'm going to comment out this field, and I'm going to show you that my lab's AWS CloudTrail data is all in JSON format, right? Well, guess what? We know what JSON format looks like. We know how we can have many, many uh, levels of JSON format, right? Here's one level. Here's another one. Uh, here's another one. Um, because we know to, how to read JSON format, you can tell us json auto and what we're going to do is we're going to go parse all the fields and traverse all the different levels and parse out all those fields for you how do you know that we parse them well here on the left hand side we have something called the field browser and the field browser shows you all the fields that got parsed there is aws region right which is coming from here um, there is collector which is coming from some other field down there i'm sorry collector is one of the main uh, metadata tags, but there is error code, error message, and so on. So the good news is that now that those fields have been parsed, I could do something like count by AWS region, right? And that's going to give me yield some results, including those that do not have a region, um, and I can see my distribution right there. Questions, concerns so far? Is this making sense? All right, if I get no responses, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that as a yes. So uh, in summary, what you want to do is you definitely wanna use metadata for your data. Uh, you wanna start using your keywords to, to limit the scope of what you're searching. Obviously, you have the ability to use Livetail to tell your logs. You can do your parsing within your statements, but most importantly, you want to start building those field extraction rules. Let me show you a couple of other options from a parsing perspective. Uh, and I'm gonna use that, uh, that PDF that has labs to show you. So the first one I want to show you is this one called the no drop. Uh, let me grab the answer first, and then I'm going to walk you through uh, through this. So I'm going to copy, paste this query here into my lab, and just show you this. So cool. Let me let me first comment those out and run a query for my labs Apache error. All right, so here's my logs for Lab Apache error. What you notice here is that there's kind of two different types of messages in here. There's, um, there, here's a good example. Look at number five and number six. Here's number five that says error, and that is followed by a mod log SQL, and then it's some sort of a message that is in there, right? Here's a second kind of error that says error, and then client, and then some sort of client IP. So. What if I wanted to parse out the client IP from this one, but I would like to parse the error message from this one, right? They're completely different types of errors with, with different types of uh, formatting. So if I were to just say, listen, I want to parse whatever is in between the, the brackets that says client star, in this case, the IP address, right? I'm, what I'm doing is I'm parsing this here and I'm grabbing the IP address. That's what this is doing. 
Um, if I don't do a node drop, look what happens. It goes and it parses all those messages and it ignores, it completely drops all the messages that don't follow that same pattern. But if I don't want to drop them because I want to do something with it, I use the no drop option. And in that case, I only, I, I parse out those that have a client IP, but, I, but those that don't have a client IP, I leave that blank. So that allows me to then have a second parse statement and say, I then want to parse model log SQL and grab whatever is there as a message. And if I run that query now, you'll see that some messages have a message and others have a client IP attached to it instead. And then I can do things like where is blank client IP and that way I would only grab those where I have a message and not. IP. So there you go. No drop is definitely an option that uh, that you will want to be using, especially for debugging purposes. It becomes pretty uh, pretty interesting to use. Here's another one: uh, the parse field operator. Let me show you doing. Um, I'm just going to grab this one, open a new query, and drop it in there so you can see. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm looking at my source category labs GitHub data. So this is my GitHub data, and I'm looking for anything that has the word committer in it. So in short, what I'm doing is I'm looking for uh, committers in GitHub. Who are, who are the committers in GitHub? And if I run that query, let me show you first. I get, um, I get these kind of messages. Um, I can view it as a JSON, by the way, which might be a little easier. Um, here, let me expand this so you can see. Uh, well, let's, let's see it here. Here's the word committer, and then I even notice that there is an email address to it, so I can see who is, act, who is the actual committer. So what I want to do in my query is I want to find out, uh, I'm going to parse out that email address so that I can find out who did it, who was the person uh, doing that stuff. So there it is. Here's one user who was committing. There's another user who was committing stuff to my GitHub repository, including happy 000, <laughs> at mail. Um, what if I wanted to uh, parse out this field additionally so that I only look for those committers from a sumologic.com domain? So what I can do is I can do parse field. I'm going to parse a field that has already been parsed. So you can use the parse field equals email, give it the parsing statement that you want to do, and use users equal uh, users and domains. And what that does is it does further parsing onto my field. So there you go. There's domain, there's the email, and there's domain, and there's users. And now you could do stuff like this. I could say, and now only choose where um, domain. Oops, domain. Oops, I keep typing it wrong. Where domain equals. Um, sumologic.com so I really only care about my committers and then I can even say um, maybe I don't want to count I just want to look at those committers in there right and there you go now I'm looking only at those committers that have a sumologic.com domain right good all right uh, these are some some good examples. I'll show you the last one, the last one that I have here as, a, as an example, parse multi. What parse multi allows you to do is it allows you to find a field that might exist multiple times in your messages. So let me show you, I'm just going to do it here. I'm going to replace this one with a new message. Um, let me show you what my lab's snort data looks like. Snort data, by the way, is security data, network intrusion. Um, uh, so I'm looking at my snort data, and if you notice, it has, um, it, it looks like it's looking for file access, attempted leak information. Here's another one that says uh, bug port, file access, attempted information leak. It has an IP address here, and it has a second IP address here. So what if you wanted to parse all the IP addresses? By default, when you do a parse statement, it will look for a pattern, and once it finds it, it's done, right? And so that's what would happen if I did not have this multi option in here. It parses it, it finds it once, and it's done. If you specify the multi option, what it's going to do is it's going to parse that one, and then it's going to repeat that same message however many times it needs to, and it's going to parse out the next IP address in here. So in this case, line number one and line number two are the exact same messages, but it parsed out, um, sorry, but it has parsed out different IP addresses for each one of them. Right? 
So there you go. A couple more options for you from a, from a parsing perspective in terms of the operators that you have available to you. Um, parsing is key because it gets that data to a state where you can start doing some stuff. Um, by the way, when we run this live, uh, we, we run these certification jams where we go to different cities to run these sessions. Um, this is where we pause and then we let people try some of these labs. Um, again, these labs are available to you. This is, the, this is that PDF that I've, that I've been showing you. Um, oops, I lost my mouse. Here we go. This is the PDF. So this is where people would pause and try and try labs one through three, right? They would try this lab, the second one, and the third one. Um, the good news for you is that I'm actually trying some of those labs uh, during this, this, this session. Um, but it's, it goes without saying that I highly recommend that you try these labs on your own as well. Okay. Let's on, uh, on to the next session. So we also talked about simple analytics, you know, the ability to create some simple, simple parse statements. Yesterday you saw me use metadata and keywords, then, then do my parsing, then start doing any additional filtering that I want, might want to do. Like you see here, I look for Apache access data that has the word Mozilla. Then I parse out the URL and the status code. Then I say where status code, oops, where status code matches five something. So I'm looking only for uh, server errors. And then I count by status codes and then I sort my counts by the, uh, sorted by count. And then I limit it to the top three count uh, in there, right? So it follows this kind of format in here. You parse, you filter, you aggregate, and then you can format your results for some, some kind of stuff. Uh, simple analytics are the basic ones, the ones that you would expect, the count, sum, average, min, max, that's pretty straightforward, right? Um, you can have if operator, you can have matches, you can have in, so the, the very basic stuff. You can have transpose, field limit, all these help you with the formatting of your results. So all that stuff is pretty straightforward. As a matter of fact, let me show you one brief example in here. Uh, we'll take this one as a good example just to show you um, how this could work. Actually, let's just grab this one, which might have a slightly different one. Um, Let's take this example in here, just drop it and run this query. But here you see, I, I run a query, I parse out a status code, then I have a couple of if statements for that stat status code, and then I'm using some very simple aggregation. I'm, I'm doing the sum here and giving it a new name. I'm using a sum here and giving it a new name. And that's how I can come up with client errors versus server errors in here. I'm looking at anything that has a 400, um, as a client error, anything that's a 500 as server errors and coming up with this sum. And then from here, you can do things like uh, charting them. Uh, that's, a, that's a bad chart, but you can do things like charting them in whichever way you want to put this together in there. All right. So I'm not going to spend too much time in the simple analytics because I want to get to the, uh, the more interesting ones. Again, there are enough labs in here for you to try some of these simple analytics uh, operators in here. But let's try some of the more advanced ones, some of the interesting ones. So I want to talk about four or five in particular. Um, outlier, predict, I want to talk about log reduce and log compare. So what is outlier? Um, uh, outlier essentially helps you identify those things that are out of the norm. And when I say out of the norm, it means look at what has happened in the past, and I, according to that, identify what, what, what's happening now is, is within the norm or not. So let me show you some examples. And for this, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to cheat a little bit, and I'm just going to go open some that I have already built. So here's an outlier example. Here's a predict example. All right. So let me show you this outlier first. I'm gonna run it and then I'm gonna come back and, and explain to you what I did. So what outlier allows me to do is, it allows me to build something like this, right? The pink triangles, um, actually let me start with the blue line. The blue line is my actual data points. The shaded area around it are the standard deviations according to whatever setting I choose. And then the pink triangles are the uh, whatever it happens to be outside of the threshold. So if I have something outside of that standard deviation, it's denoted by a pink triangle. So how do we put this together? How do, how do we do it? Well, first let me explain what the query is and then I'll talk about what Outlier is doing. So this, in this case, I'm doing source category equals lab Apache and status code equals 404. So I'm really only looking at my 404s, right? Second thing that you notice is because 
I have a field extraction rule, I can do this thing. I don't have to say where status code equals 44. I can just add status code to my top uh, query here. So, all right, so first is identify only those messages that have a status code of 404. Then I want you to do a time slice by one minute. That means these 60 minutes that you have here, break them down into one minute buckets. So I'm gonna have 60 buckets of each. And then I want to count my 404s. So I wanna count the status codes. I, I just, this as server error count is just a, a way to give it a, a better name. Um, to give this uh, a better name. I'm just I'm just naming my count server error count. Actually, shouldn't it be client error count because it's a status code of 404? Anyway, um, so I'm counting my status codes, in this case, by time slice. So I want to get a count for every minute that I have of my 404s, right? So, so far, what I've done is what you've seen before. Let me comment out that outlier and just run that query and show you the results. All that this has done so far is said, all right, for this time slice, let me put this in order. For 932, I have 88 errors. For, uh, for 933, I have 200 and so on and so forth. So basically, I have 60 of these time slices, and it's just showing me the count of errors for, the, for each given time, right? So far, so good. And if I put that on a line, it would look something like that, which is how many errors I've had in each minute, which is, yeah, something interesting to know. You might want to know when that you have spikes. So what Outlier allows you to do is say, great, for that server error count, I want you to go back five data points. So let's say for this data point in here that I'm highlighting. For that data point, I want you to go back to the previous five data points and look at where they were and find out if this data point is really outside of the norm or not. Right, so that's what that window is all about us. Look at historical data, five data points back and find out if my current point is within the threshold or not. Consecutive means, actually, let me jump back consecutive first and go to threshold. Threshold means how many standard deviations should I look at? Should I look at three, four, five standard deviations? Consecutive means should I alert you of every single point that is outside of the standard deviation, or should I wait for two or three or five consecutive data points before I alert you? And the fifth one is, should I alert you of everything above the threshold or also for those things below the threshold? So let's run this query as is. There you go, you can see it. And let's change some of these values. So notice I have about six data points that happen to be outside of the standard deviation. What if I change that threshold to be three? I'm hopefully going to have less data points outside of the standard deviation. As a matter of fact, I only have two because I made my standard deviation uh, now, my threshold a little bit bigger by having three uh, thresholds, right? Um, same thing would happen if I change this to a 10. I'm looking for a longer period, which would smooth out uh, my, uh, my standard deviation curves because I'm now looking for a longer period of time of thresholds in there. All right. Any questions on outlier? Does this make sense? Good, good, good. Let's, uh, let me talk about a, another one here, predict. Predict is pretty, uh, pretty obvious from, from the name. What it does is it forecasts your data points going in the future. So if I look at the line in here, this is showing me uh, all the requests that I get against Lab Apache. And then I'm just look, doing a count on requests. And then I'm saying, listen, predict according to what you know so far, which is this light blue line in here, and according to the current request, predict the next 12 requests by a five minute increment. Essentially give me the next hour's worth of, uh, of, of, um, of predictions. And so you notice that there is a slight uh, down trend on my, on my requests, which is if, uh, if, if, I, if these were my servers and this is the end of the day, that's a good thing. I can see that uh, traffic's dying down a little bit. Or, or if it's the beginning of the day, I could, I could use this to start identifying what kind of needs I'm going to have um, for my servers uh, for the rest of the day. All right. So predict pretty straightforward. Um, I want to show you another more interesting one, and that one is um, log reduce and log compare. And this, these are pretty cool ones. Let me first run a quick query to find some, um, let's say, some security data. Let's use that snort data. All right. So remember snort data that I was talking about? Let me make this 60 minutes to make it a little more interesting. 
So this is security uh, data. This is attacks that are happening in my environment, right? So if I'm the security engineer, I want to keep an eye on my snort data, and I want to know if I, I'm getting new attacks. So for example, look here, I, there's an attempted information leak in here. There's a uh, network Trojan was detected. Um, there's a web application attack, right? If I know the names of the attacks, then it's easy. I can say and, um, and leak, and it's gonna go find every message that has the word leak in it, as you see here. Or I could say and uh, leak or attack and it's gonna go find any of the messages that have those two words in it, right? Leak and attack, right? But what if I don't know what's attacking me? What if I don't know what I don't know, right? So in that case, I'm looking at 60 minutes worth of data, in this case, about 6,300 messages, and I would have to sort through these 6,000 um, or, or eyeball them um, and, and look at those 6,000 messages to see what's going on. Alternatively, I can hit this button called log reduce. And here's the great thing about log reduce. What it's doing right now is it's looking at those 6,000 messages and it's compiling them into signatures. And it comes back and it tells me, hey Mario, I went through those 6,000 messages and here's the deal. About 3,200 of those messages all look very similar. They all say bug port config.conf file access classification colon attempted information leak. Yes, the date might be different and the bug port ID might be different, perhaps the IP address might be different, but for the most part, they look so similar that Sumo decided to put them together into one same um, signature, kind of to reduce the noise. If you notice, now I only have one page worth of data, then I can, I can go through this one page and easily see these things. By the way, you have a couple of actions that you can do in these signatures, and Sumo is gonna be learning from these actions. For example, if you promote the signature, if you say, oh, this is a good signature and I, I want you to keep it up, then Sumo is going to improve its relevance, and then later on you can, you can sort by relevance. Or let's say that you actually wanted to, um, uh, to, um, to change some of the stuff in here. Let, let's say that uh, you wanted to also make uh, the file name here a variable. You can do that. You can just make it a variable. And now this, this signature is going to be paired up with other signatures that have that as a variable as well. And you're going to get less noise in your, uh, in your in your messages themselves. So my point here is that it took pages and pages worth of data and distilled them into a couple of signatures, so just one page, and now I can scroll down and look at something very particular. More, more specifically, I can look at things that are happening only a few times, like here's this one, invalid data version, attempted denial of service. So that's something that only happened four times, in the last 60 minutes, maybe I want to explore this a little more. So I can even click on this thing. It takes me to, uh, to the four messages themselves. And let's say that I want to focus on the first one, which, which happened at 1642. And I want to find out what was happening right before it and what was happening right after it. So I could even say, listen, I'm going to go and look at this lab snort data and I'm gonna look at the surrounding messages uh, one minute before or one minute after. Or if I even know that it's not just snore data, but it's specific about uh, on this host itself, I can do that too. I can look at the host data uh, for one minute before and one minute after, and now I have the context of what was happening right before that breach, all right? Okay, so log reduce a very, very powerful tool to be able to compile stuff into signatures. Um, also, similar to log reduce, we have something called log compare. And let me click that while it's running, kind of explain to you what it's doing. What log compare is doing right now is it's running a log reduce. Remember, we just talked about log reduce. So it's running a log reduce for the last 60 minutes, but it's also running a log reduce 24 hours ago for data 24 hours ago. So it's taking, it's going back 24 hours, it's taking 60 minutes worth of data, and then it's comparing the signatures from now to the signatures from 24 hours ago. And it's coming back and it's saying, listen, Mario, here is a, uh, here's a signature that was, that happened 3,000 times now, and that's only a 
0.89% increase from what it was happening before. So that's a good thing. It's pretty stable. Something that was happening yet before that, uh, that seems to be happening still now. Okay, let's look at something that might be a little scarier. So how about, um, hmm, actually nothing seems to be increasing a lot from 24 hours ago, but let's say that, oh, here we go, this one. This one is saying, listen, this one happened, uh, this one that says potentially bad traffic happened 34 times 60 minutes ago, and that is a 13% increase from what it was happening uh, 24 hours ago. But here's a good one. Oh, actually, that's a bad one. Um, I was trying to see if I had a, a more interesting time period. Let's see. Let's grab three hours. And by the way, this time shift of 24 is just the default. If you notice, you can choose 24 hours, seven days. You could even choose a custom time frame if you wanted to as well. Um, let's see if this has a little something more interesting. Yeah, this is a good one. So here's one. This one is happening 12 hours. I'm sorry, 12 times, and that's a 48% increase from when it was happening 24 hours ago. So this might be something that you definitely want to pay attention and go investigate now. Or here's another one. This is a brand new one. This wasn't happening at all before. I didn't have a version map attempt, detection of a network scan, 24 hours ago, but I'm, I am having it now, so I can go and investigate. But look at this, this one here, the, the, the number 14. This is something that was happening 24 hours ago and now is completely gone. So if I did any work to mitigate this, uh, this one, um, then now it's completely gone and I'm not seeing that anymore. So log compare, an um, incredibly useful tool, just like log reduce. Again, log reduce kind of helps you identify that needle in the haystack by identifying patterns. And then log, log compare is allowing you to look at your patterns today and compare them to patterns in the past and identify what was happening then. Um, so yeah, that, that, that should give you an idea of some good advanced uh, operators. Um, unfortunately, there's so many operators that I would not have the ability to, uh, to go through them all. Um, there is a cheat sheet, by the way. If you go to the Home tab and under that you go to Learn, there is a cheat sheet here of all our operators um, that, it, that lists them for you. But the good thing is it lists them by function. So, for example, here's all the parsing operators. There's the parse anchor that I showed you, parse regex, key value. Remember those from the beginning of today? Um, here's some aggregation operators. So average, count, uh, fill missing, min, max, percentage. Um, so clearly, um, way more operators that I can go through today. So what I was trying to do is show you some of the more, uh, some of the operators that you'll be, you'll be using uh, the most through here. Um, but if you notice the way that this is set up is it shows you, uh, it tells you the operator, it shows you an example, and then it shows you how it was put together. Um, this is a good one, geo lookup. Let me actually show you how this one works. So um, what this allows you to do is take IP addresses and then go against a database that we provide for you um, to map out the, uh, the addresses and whatnot. So let's just take an example here. How about we grab this example and we're just gonna go paste it in one of ours so you can see it. Um, let me go in and uh, what do we have here? Yeah, let's put it in here. Um, oh, I'm gonna need um, I'm gonna need some source data, right? So why don't we get our Apache data source category category equals uh, labs Apache access labs Apache. Oops, it's not filling. Oh, there we go. Labs Apache access. We have our IP address already parsed. I think it's called source IP. So what we're gonna do is just source IP, we're just going to say, listen, go up, go against this geolocation database and find for us longitude, latitude, and all these other fields where IP address is the IP address that we've parsed already. Um, and let's run that query. And what you should see is that we get back um, a table of all the different IP addresses with these fields, latitude, longitude, country code, and all that good stuff. And then we should be able to map that IP address uh, against that stuff. Hmm. For some reason, it's taking a little bit of time. Not sure why that is the case. Let me see if we go against uh, this other database, the vault. Hmm. Hmm. 
maybe my network connection is a little slow. There we go. Okay. So here's the latitude and longitude. There's country code, name, region, postal code. I can even use a little map in here and be able to map this stuff. So you've probably seen quite a few maps and how we put this stuff together. This is exactly how we do it. We're just using that geo lookup operator um, to do that kind of stuff. Right. Um, by the way, we have lookups to other stuff. We have lookups to um, if you have your own spreadsheet that you want to put somewhere, you, we have an operator for that. You can do a lookup to that operator, uh, to that spreadsheet. We also have threat intelligence data. Um, so for those of you in the security space, we have an app called Threat Intel that does a lookup to CrowdStrike data. And uh, this, by the way, is all free. So this uh, map data that we provide, this Cloud CrowdStrike uh, security data that we provide, it's all free. Um, and these are lookups that you can do against other sources uh, to go find that data as well. Or if you have your own source, like some sort of spreadsheet that you want to put out there, you can do lookups against that as well. Okay, so um, again, I will highly encourage that you try some of the labs. Some of them make you go through, uh, through some of these uh, lookups as well and trying some of this stuff. Um, I've been talking a lot about logs, and let's talk a little bit about metrics themselves. So metrics, you can, you can bring host metrics from your, from your servers. Um, if you have an installed collector already taking logs from that, uh, from that host, guess what? It's pretty easy to turn on and grab metrics from that host as well. Um, we, take, we can take AWS metrics. So if you have uh, AWS sends all these metrics to CloudWatch, and we can grab them from there. And also, we can grab graphite compatible metrics. So, Drop Wizard, StatsD, CollectD, we can grab all that data onto Sumo Logic. Um, cool thing is that we have a lot of apps. Um, for those of you who joined yesterday, you probably saw that we have tons of apps. And by apps, I mean, give me just a second. Um, where is my mouse? There it is. So if you go here and go to the app catalog, you'll notice that for a lot of sources, um, give me just one second, I seem to have an unstable connection. Um, just one second, it looks like uh, my connection was a little unstable for there for just a little bit. I hope this is improving it. Hmm. Okay, give me just one second. Let me see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, it looks like I'm back. It seems like it dropped me off of the connection. Um, can one of you just confirm that you can actually hear me and you can see my screen? I would appreciate it. Um, if one of you just lets me know through the chat that you actually can uh, can hear me and can see me can see my screen. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, it looks like um, I got disconnected from the Zoom connection there for a second. But anyway, uh, I was mentioning before that we have all these we have all these apps. Um, okay, someone someone saying that the audio is choppy sometimes. Okay. Uh, let me let me make sure that this goes a little smoother. So I was talking about apps themselves. So apps, what what apps are uh, are out of the box content. Essentially, we have so many customers um, that have used so many different sources that we have a pretty good idea what are the things that someone is looking from CloudTrail, right? We know that they need console logins. We know that they need network and security information. We know that they need user monitoring. So we've created already dashboards, pre-built dashboards that you can use to start analyzing your data. So just like we do that for logs, we also do that for metrics as well, right? So if you're using Amazon RDS, we have metrics that we can pull from there, right? If you're using, um, uh, actually, let me do this. Why don't I type the word metrics in here? Metrics. So if you're using AWS ELB, we can pull metrics. We can pull host metrics. So just like we can pull uh, information uh, logs, we can, we can also bring um, uh, metrics. And we have a lot of apps for that kind of stuff as well. Um, so I was trying to show you here, uh, this is what the out-of-the-box app looks like for your host metrics themselves. Um, if I can drop me off again. Share screen. 
Sorry, guys. Looks like it dropped me off again, um, but you should be seeing my video, and hopefully you can hear me. Um, yeah, okay, great. I'm not sure what's going on with this, but here we go. Um, okay, so I was mentioning how you can... Um, I was mentioning how you can uh, you can have apps for multiple sources in here, right? So getting your metrics into Sumo, getting your logs into Sumo will normally allow you to have those metrics. Um, we talked in the demo yesterday about what we call log and metrics overlay, the ability to display your logs um, right on top of your metrics so that you can identify if something is going on in your environment as well, right? Uh, the metrics help you identify that what, the logs that help you identify the why. Um, again, we give you quite a few labs for you to try out. I'm not going to go through the uh, through the through some of the examples. I'll let you play with some of those uh, basic analytics for your metrics as well as uh, some of the more advanced logs and metrics examples when you try these labs themselves. But um, what I want to talk a little bit about is monitoring your data. Um, Obviously, you want to start creating your dashboards, and uh, creating dashboards are super, super easy. The key to creating dashboards, though, is that at the end of the day, you want to make sure that you're sharing that content because um, other people can benefit from that content that you create. So let me show you an example for creating a dashboard. It's uh, fairly, fairly straightforward. The way to create a dashboard is um, you, you look at the content that you've built, and right here on the right-hand side, it's as easy as saying add to dashboard. And um, you would give your panel a brief example. So let's say uh, 404 outliers, uh, you would give it a name, and then you would specify the name of your dashboard. And I think just yesterday I was creating one called the brand new dash. So I'm just gonna add mine to that one that already existed. And you click on add, and as you would expect, what it does is it just, takes the dashboard that already existed and it adds your panel to that dashboard. So there you go, here's my, uh, here's my dashboard that I had built. I can remove it if I want to, I can resize it, I can change it, I can do whatever I want in here. So creating dashboards is uh, it's fairly, fairly straightforward. It's pretty, pretty easy to do and build as you see here. Um, if I wanted to add another panel to this existing dashboard, easy enough. Let's say I wanna add this predict one, in here, I can just say add to dashboard, um, give it a name if I want to, change it if I want to, specify the dashboard that you want to do it. I'm gonna add it to that same brand new dash again, click on add, and as simple as that, my new dashboard or my new panel has been added to my dashboard. Um, you can move things around, you can resize them, you can change that kind of stuff. Uh, probably more interesting to know is the fact that you can also um, uh, toggle themes. Uh, this, this is the easy stuff, right? So, uh, deleted, star it, and whatnot. But more importantly, you can share this dashboard. I can click in here and decide that I am gonna share it. Let's say that I wanna allow everybody to view this dashboard. So I can say my entire organization can view this dashboard, right? Um, but then I wanna add other users that have a different access level. Then I wanna say that only some person, let's say that I'm gonna say uh, Caleb here. I wanna say that Caleb, uh, who's one of my administrators is going to have edit access to it or even manage access to it. Let's say edit access. So that way I'm letting the entire organization view it, but I'm only letting Caleb edit it. As you can see here, I can click on share. And then this dashboard, if I go back to those sharing options, you'll notice that if I see that who has access, the entire organization can view it, I can manage it, and Caleb can edit it if I wanted to as well. Right. You can obviously continue to add more roles in here if you wanted to. Um, or alternatively, you can specify that some people can have the ability to view this dashboard if they have the URL. That means that they wouldn't, uh, if they are logged onto the system, they can take this URL and view this dashboard. Or you can even make this dashboard available outside of people who have a log on to Sumo. You can say, I want anybody in this world <laughs> to be able to, who has access to this URL to be able to view that dashboard. 
that's a little bit dangerous. So most likely than not, you would want to say, I'm going to whitelist a few IP addresses, and anybody who's in that IP address whitelist will be able to uh, view that dashboard without the need to log on to Sumo. So there's quite a lot of options there for you in terms of sharing your dashboards, even including people that don't have a Sumo Logic log on to, into Sumo. Last thing I'm going to show you about dashboards is you have the ability to create filters as well. So here's an example of one that I added so people can specify their region. Um, you can just click on add filters and you'll have the ability to include a filter here that you want to um, for your dashboards so that people can use these dashboards as templates and come in here, enter the region, and then all the panels would get set up to, uh, to their specific region need. Questions on what you heard so far? No, nope, pretty straightforward. Okay, uh, I'm going to show you one uh, one other thing, or one last thing, I should say, and that is um, that is uh, receiving notifications. So alerting, um, creating alerts is actually pretty simple. Creating interesting alerts is what what's going to make the difference. So let me show you an example here of uh, of three different alerts. One one each better than the next. So I'm going to open this alert one, alert two, and alert three. All right. Let me go back to this once. I'm going to close some of these other ones here to make it easy for you to follow. So let me show you the first alert. The first alert just says, listen, go grab all the status 404s and give me a count of those by time slice. Every one minute, show me what the count of those 404s are. And here's the count. And it looks like those alerts are usually around 200, 200 and something. So I can easily say, if the count of alerts of, of 404s ever goes above 250, let me know about it. So there you go. Here I have four cases where alerts are greater than 250. Pretty straightforward. All I did is I specified a, a static threshold, and I now have, um, have a, a way to alert on those things. How do you alert? The mechanic is pretty easy. All you do is you say, save as, schedule the search, I want to say I want to run this every hour, for example, and I want you to alert me only if the following condition is met. So in this case, we're going to say, if the number of results happen to be greater than zero, alert me. Why does that work? Because it works because of that where clause. Remember the where clause says if, 200, if, if count is greater than 250? So if count is less than 250, I'm not going to get results, therefore don't alert me. Right, and we saw yesterday how to create an email alert. We talked a little bit about being being able to send it through a webhook, being able to save it to the index, be able to create script action, and so on. Right. All right, that's pretty straightforward. But let's talk about a more interesting alert. So the problem with this alert is that it might give me uh, it might give me some false positives, meaning that not always will the count be greater than uh, um, I should say. Sometimes a count of 250 is not a bad thing, right? If my traffic has increased, then my status code 404s will also increase, and it's just not necessarily a bad thing. It's, it's a lot of noise that I would get in my alerts. So here's a better type of alert. In this case, I'm using outlier. I do the same thing. I do counts all the way up to here, and then after that, let me get some real estate. All right, I do counts all the way up to here, and then I use outlier, to determine whether something happens to be um, within the standard deviation or not. So in this case, everything is within standard deviations, um, but if I change it to a threshold of two, for example, then I'm gonna have some examples in here uh, where I am outside of that standard deviation. If you notice, there's the little pink triangle, there's a little pink triangle. If I look at the table view of that, those little count violations, Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to click on here. Um, those count violations show as a one in here. So all I have to do is put a where clause saying where count violation is greater than zero. In that case, it's gonna tell me if I have any of those pink triangles. And now I can do the exact same thing. Save as, schedule the search, and you, you get the point, right? I can just say, if I get results in this query, alert me, because that means that I actually have violations. All right. So far, so good. This is this this dashboard or this alert is a lot better because what it's doing is it's looking at historical data, it's looking at uh, past 
previous data points and identifying if something is outside of the standard deviation or not. But it could still give you false positives because if your traffic were to spike, um, let's say that uh, all of a sudden you put a promotion on your, on your website, your traffic spikes, then you get a large increase in your 404s and that's not necessarily a bad thing. So let me show you the third example. And the third example is doing something pretty interesting. What it's, it's still using outlier in here. But in this case, what I do is I look at my 404s, which are the ones I'm concerned about, but I also look at my 200s. My 200s are representative of my traffic. So I'm looking at my 404s in the context of my 200s. And then I do something like, if status code matches 200, then I create a count of successes. If my status code matches 400, then I create a, a, a I, I set a one and a zero for fails. So all I've done up to here is I've created two new variables called successes and fails. I take it a step further and then I sum up those successes and fails and I create a success count and a fail count by time slice. And then I take that fail count divided by the success count and I create what I call a failure rate. So I have a good idea up to here. Let me just comment this out. I have a pretty good idea of my failure rate. And I can see that if I have a huge increase in my failure rate, that means that I had a case where my successes increased at a higher rate than my uh, fails did, or actually the other way around, that my fails increased at a higher rate than my successes increased. So then I can place an outlier on that failure rate and have a much more representative uh, query showing me kind of the same results. View-wise, it's the same thing, right? I'm still looking, um, well, actually, this is so small because there's very little variation. Um, let's see if we can tweak this a little bit. So these data points go from 0.04. Uh, let's see if I can tweak that just a little bit. Uh, let me go here, and then I have a question that I'm going to respond in just a second, but let me just make this a little bit um, clearer. I'm going to change properties. Oops, it's not what I wanted to do. Um, I'm going to go to this guy here, change properties, change the axes, and what if I go from uh, 0.01 to 0.1? There you go. So that looks a little bit better. I just changed the axis here. So what you see here is kind of the same line. I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at the same uh, situation, but in this case, I'm not just doing a count of four fours, but instead I'm doing a relationship of my four fours to my two hundreds. And in this case, is what it's showing me that my four fours increased at a higher rate than my four than my two hundreds, and therefore I should alert on that. So the same thing happens. I put a little where clause, and then I can set this up as a threshold. Okay, let me go to the question. The question says from Bertrand, what is the one and the zero in the if clause? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, what this is doing here is it's saying, as a matter of fact, let me show you. Um, I'm going to comment these others out. And this is actually a good thing for you guys to see how you go about and just comment things out. If you find a query that is doing a lot, comment out the steps and just follow it through. And that's going to give you a good sense of what it's doing. So in this case, what we're doing is we're saying, listen, um, by the way, I just wanted to show you the matches operator. I could have done this, right? If status code equals, um, what was it, 200? And if status code equals 404. This is, this is doing the same thing. We, we, we know it's going to be those. We don't have to use the matches operator. So we can simplify it this way. Okay. What this is doing is it's saying, if it's going to be a 200, set this new field called successes to one and set this one to a zero. So if you notice successes here is set to one, 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 one. All these are one because, uh, because this, this happens to have a 200. And the fails has, uh, is gonna have a zero unless this thing is set to 400, right? So uh, in, this, in this screen that I'm looking at, all happen to be 200s. Uh, but in short, what I do is I create two new fields, one field called successes and one field called fails that has a whole bunch of ones and zeros. Ones if they're 200s, zeros if they're not 200s. And then what it, that allows me to do is, since they are just a whole bunch of ones and zeros, I can use the sum operator and sum them up and find out my count of how many, um, 
of how many 200s I have and how many 400s or 404s I have. So essentially, the ones and zeros are just flags so that, so that then I can sum up all the ones and get my success count, and then I can sum all the ones from the fails and get my fail counts. Does that make sense, uh, Bertrand? Excellent, excellent. Um, since, since you asked, uh, and we're on this thing, uh, I, wanna sh I wanna point something very, very helpful for you guys. Um, I'm going to go to the Home tab, and from the Home tab to the Learn tab, and I'm gonna uh, pull up this community, uh, this community uh, link. Essentially, we have a community, um, think of it as a forums, where you can put your questions, you can search through questions. So if you have a question about how to send data into Sumo, you can post it in here, you can read some of the questions that have been asked. Um, but in particular, I wanted to point out to this query library, what this is, is um, we post here a lot of queries that, that, uh, that we think that are very useful. For example, um, we're having a lot of security focused customers. Um, so here are, um, here Marie actually put some secu uh, security related queries for AWS how to monitor root usage account. So here is a query that you can just grab and paste in your environment. And all you would have to do is tweak it to your own source category. But for the most part, um, this query should work for you. Same thing, here's another one, permit any ingress. So you can create security groups, right? And you wanna identify all the security groups that are allowing you way too much uh, uh, permit any uh, ingress or outgress uh, info in there. Here's another one that allows you to 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 identify the two uh, two logins that are from two different places at, in a very short time. So kind of impossible travel. Think of it: someone logging in from Texas and someone in in three minutes, someone else logging in from uh, I don't know Ukraine, and you're like, wait, hold on, that that's not impossible. So that that could be a sign of uh, compromised credentials, right? So my point is. This query library has tons and tons and tons of queries that you should be able to take advantage of. And the reason I remember it is because uh, down at the bottom in this, there is a, uh, there's one called Creating Meaningful Alerts that was built by yours truly. And it's this same exact query, right? Here is that same exact query that I just walked you guys through. Let me make this a little bit bigger for you. There we go. Here's that same exact query that I just ran. But my point is that that query can be used for just about anything. Let's say that you have your own app that you developed and you have your own custom apps and you want to, uh, you want to do a, a count of, uh, you wanna look at percentage of errors that you're getting. So then you wanna look at messages that have errors versus messages that don't have errors in there, right? And, and do a count on that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, again, this query library is full, full, full of good examples of things that you can, uh, that you can take as, as, as examples, just like this PDF is as well. Um, this PDF, as you go through these labs, it's going to have a lot, a lot of, uh, the, the answers are in the PDF, which is a good thing, um, but those PDF, those, those examples serve as templates for you to be able to build the same stuff in your own environment as well. All right, so with that said, uh, labs point to you, uh, or the, the slide points you to the labs to try some of those things. And then use cases, again, these use cases, guess where they point you? They actually point you to community. Here are use cases, for example, how to create a, an alert on ratios or percentages. So here in this case, uh, Graham has uh, taken the time to even include screenshots of how to build a lot of these use cases as well within Sumo. So again, I'll be, sharing you, uh, I'll be sharing with you these slides that have links to these particular use cases, how to detect patterns and changes, oops, how to detect patterns and changes across environments and all that good stuff. All right, so with that said, uh, where do you go from here? I would highly suggest that you explore the Learn tab. Um, there are some tutorials if you haven't tried those tutorials just yet. There are some videos that walk you through very specific things like uh, like how to, uh, how to use Livetail and so on. There's the links to all those other items that I talked about. Um, and of course, what I would suggest is um, take the exam, level two uh, exam. If you 
you've been through this webinar, if you try those labs, I highly, highly recommend that you try them. These labs will be a piece of cake for you. As a matter of fact, most of the labs, I would say 90, 95% of the lab, uh, I'm sorry, the, the questions in the exam, 90 to 95% of the questions in the exam are based on the labs themselves. So pretty straightforward uh, for you to take those, uh, those labs. All right, let me pause there. Let me pause the recording and open it up for questions.